Welcome to Thought to Action, presented by the London Centre for Policy Research. I'm Tim Wilson, a senior fellow at the Centre. For this programme, on this programme, we discuss ideas, solutions to issues and bringing our thoughts to action. Follow us at the London Centre's Twitter page at the LCPR and the London Centre's Facebook page. And for more on the London Centre for Policy Research, who we are and what we do, visit londoncentre.org. If you'd like to help us create more content like this and enjoy future exclusive versions of Ask Us Anything and other special content, we welcome you to become part of our Patreon community at patreon.com slash thought to action. Also feel free to share this with, with uh, and comment on our discussions, share it with friends. We appreciate you helping us spread the word about our program and conversations. Today on Thought to Action, we have Andrew Pollock, who is president of the Crime Prevention Research Center and um, author of a great book, Why Maddow Died, and a real leader and extremely well informed on um, gun rights and gun issues and gun control. Welcome, Andrew. Oh, thanks for having me today. It's my pleasure to be with you. I'd very much like to discuss uh, gun control and gun rights issues. And let's start with, uh, if you wouldn't mind, um, where, where people can find your book, which I think is a really important book on the issue, and how you got into the whole thing. Well, my book is on Amazon, uh, Why Metal Died. And I thought it was very important uh, to show the public the true story of the failed policies uh, that were pioneered in Broward County and got my daughter murdered. Uh, and the, the mainstream media didn't want to cover those policies. And I thought it was very important to educate parents in, in the country about these policies. So they, you know, potentially don't make the mistake that I did by putting my daughter in, in a school uh, with these policies that made made it unsafe and dangerous. I assume you really got into this because uh, the school was a gun-free zone. And despite the fact that there are 400 million guns in private hands in this country, the vast, vast majority of which are owned by law-abiding people, um, for some reason, a small minority that don't like guns have decided that guns in some places are too dangerous to be allowed. Sure. Well, how I got it, I was never involved with politics or gun rights uh, before my daughter was murdered. Uh, I always had a, uh, a gun permit. Uh, even when I lived in New York, I had a, a target uh, permit that allowed me to go back and forth to the range. And I carried as much as I can, uh, was able, legally. Yeah. Uh, but when, when I'm, after my daughter got murdered, before my daughter w was even buried, uh, the, the whole... Uh, incident, this whole mass shooting got uh, focused, was only focused on gun control. And to be honest, I didn't want either path. I just wanted to know the truth. Yeah. I didn't go down that path of gun control, but I'm not, if it was gun control, I'd be here talking to you, you might not have me on, but I'd be talking to you how I thought it was, uh, we needed more gun laws. Sure. So I took a step back and I analyzed everything. I actually, it was so much to take in. I wrote a book uh, about it to educate parents. Uh, and like I said, before she was murdered, before she was buried, the, the mainstream media, a lot of the Parkland parents, all those kids that became famous off of my daughter being murdered, uh, all focused on gun control without looking into these policies that enabled this murderer to be able to purchase a rifle. So, so I became an advocate, you know, wh when I started looking into this research, I said, people started writing me, uh, hey, we knew this kid was gonna be the murderer. We knew he was gonna shoot up the school. We had no doubt, you know, that this was the murderer. So I, I kept saying, how could this be? And as I started looking into all his records, I found out, he, or he threatened to shoot the school up. He threatened to rape other students. He, he trespassed at the school after he already threatened to shoot the school up and was never arrested. He tried committing suicide, never Baker acted where it would go, you know, to the full extent where it would go on his background, where he wouldn't be able to purchase a rifle. 
Right. So I looked into these policies and I thought it was my duty to educate that it wasn't, you know, the gun laws, if they were enforced, the ones that were in place, this murderer wouldn't have been able to purchase the rifle. If uh, students were held accountable uh, at, at a young age, uh, they'd be taught right from wrong. Uh, instead of putting them into in these policies I discuss in my book, it was called restorative justice policies. And they didn't want, they didn't want kids getting arrested. They didn't want kids getting expelled. Uh, and it really started with kids of color, okay? And, and it expanded it. It expanded into this whole community where kids weren't held accountable for, uh, for breaking the law. Uh, when my daughter was in school, if you could believe it, uh, students were allowed four misdemeanors per school year without ever getting introduced to law enforcement so they could assault the teacher, assault another student, sell drugs, steal an iPhone, and be put in a healing circle. So, you know, those are just things that got me so involved in what happened. And I'm passionate about it. And it brought me into contact with the prior president and founder, John Lott, because I wanted to know facts about gun laws. I wanted to educate people about the safety of, of being able to conceal carry. So that's what led me to, uh, to the Crime Prevention Research Center and to be an advocate for the Second Amendment. Let me just say now that that's also what led me to the Crime Pre Prevention Research Center, uh, which um, please give the web address of before we go. Um, but basically, it is a source of solid data and facts openly discussed. And it's the it's the one place I know of where every aspect of solid data, where it comes from, what what is good about it, what is bad about it, and every other aspect of anything to do with crime prevention is openly discussed by people that really understand it. And that's why I'm delighted to have you on the show. Oh, thank you so much. And another thing that, you know, after this happened with my daughter, there's uh, Florida was mostly Republican run. Uh, and I think, uh, they came up with solutions. Uh, Governor Scott at the time formed the Marjorie Stoneman Douglas Safety Commission in to look into the shooting to come up with solutions. They didn't just push an agenda, you know, where Democrats, uh, when coming to Parkland, uh, they didn't look into any failed policies. They just focused on the policy of gun control, which I knew it wouldn't have worked. You know, I the only policy that would have worked is if they would have arrested this, the, this garbage when he threatened to shoot the school up, when he punched his mother's teeth out in a domestic violence uh, uh, call from the sheriffs. Uh, so, so what I'm getting at is through this commission, uh, they looked into all the failures that happened that day to my daughter and those other students and teachers. And they came up with, you know, the murderer reloaded inside that school five times. Yeah. Uh, he reloaded his weapon. At, and at any time in that school, someone with a, another firearm that was trained could have easily killed this, killed this animal. You know what I mean? Instead of the only people that rushed in were two unarmed coaches who got killed immediately. So what came out of it, which is a policy I really truly believe in, is the ability to able to arm teachers who voluntarily go through a high intense training program where they're able to carry at schools. Yep. And if you look at it now with the Biden administration and Democrats, what they're pushing is to defund police, remove police officers from schools. And, and I know it's, it's a failed policy, you know, because I've seen it, you know, I couldn't watch the video of my daughter getting murdered, but right. friend, good friends of mine on that commission watched it and they, they voted 14 out of the 15 commissioners voted to be able to arm teachers in schools because they saw how important it would have been and how many lives could have been saved if there was a highly trained teacher in the building. But in Broward, where my daughter was murdered, they don't allow it because it's run, they have uh, these democratic policies and these leftists don't agree on the, abil the ability to train, highly train them to a program where they make our kids safer, but it's not in Broward. 
But schools, if you look on our website, a lot of the schools are much safer. We, we, we analyzed te where teachers are able to carry against not carrying. Right. I, I'm fascinated by this. I mean, if you look at across the country, there's a generalization there. Um, and you mentioned how many historic gun control policies basically were aimed at preventing people of color from getting it. And that still seems to be the case. The high crime areas tend to be the places where both there is fairly strict gun control and there are a lot of um, minority people living. Well, I, I think I forget the statistic, but I don't know how many people were shot over the weekend in, in Chicago and killed. What you bring up is important because in these urban areas, this uh, Biden's policy is he's going to put some more uh, fees on owning, uh, you know, weapons and stuff yep. like that. There are also an awful lot of ex-military around the, 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 the country. And I speak as, obviously, you will gather from my accent, a former British Army guy. And I also trained as a teacher in my youth um, and have been a strong gun advocate all along. And it, it dismays me that um, people who are already trained are refuse permission, you know, trained and trusted by the country to carry weapons in defense of that country. And yet they are not allowed if they become teachers after their military career to carry a weapon in, in many schools. Yeah, one of the uh, coaches that actually got murdered uh, instantly was ex-military. And, and, you know, I think it would be highly beneficial to take, you know, we always talk about let's help our veterans. You know, that's a whole nother career that we could put our veterans through in our training, you know, and they, they're highly vetted to, you know, because I know about the program, they highly vet them for mental illness yep. uh, through these programs we have in Florida to, to, to screen them. So we could really use these veterans and put them to work in these schools, places of worship, train them and put them to work. I'm sure they'd love to get out there and work protecting our children on our churches and temples. Yeah, I so totally it's definitely agree. a great, we're doing it in Florida. Uh, with this, we, we named the program after one of the coaches, Aaron Feist. He went into the building and got killed. So yeah. it's called the Aaron Feist Guardian Program. And, uh, and I witnessed the training, man. It, it's pretty intense. So anyone that could pass and go through that training that we have in Florida would be an asset for any temple or church or school. So I'm a big advocate of it because I witnessed it. Yeah. And I, it's interesting, of course, there was a... Uh, um, the incident in Texas last year that made the news where the security guard who was retired policeman, retired FBI, I think, um, killed the perpetrator before he could do more damage. There are so many defensive gun uses that we ha hear very little about. And I, in, I think part of that is because sometimes defensive gun use takes as little as just showing that you have a weapon. It is interesting, is it not? I'm sure you're aware of the uh, historical facts around school shootings that I don't believe there's ever been one in a school where teachers are allowed to be armed. But also, there's not many in private schools also, uh, if you look up the stats from uh, right. back. You know, you go through the stats and, and I'll give you a reason why it's not really in, in private schools. But getting to that point where you don't have signs that it's a no gun zone. And now you even see signs. You bring up Texas. They have signs that teachers are highly trained and armed and will defend their students with deadly force. They're using those signs. What student's going to go or a shooter is going to go into that school? They're going to go down the street to the no gun zone sign like any other criminal. You know, signs, these signs don't stop criminals from being uh, from committing evil acts. And it's something, you know, the de Democrat policies are believing, you know, let's remove the police from the schools. Let's defund the police and give them more money for mental health uh, counselors to be with the police officers. It does seem as though uh, people strange political belief that if they pass a law or put a sign up saying something is not allowed, nobody is going to do it. Whereas we know perfectly well that criminals do not obey the law and people who have mental health issues, they too are not going to obey signs or whatever, but there is some rationality in the way that 
many of the uh, mass shootings in this country have been con carried out by people who most of us would regard as, as insane. And yet they pick quite deliberately, and we know from some of their planning documents, they pick places where they're not going to meet an armed response quickly. Correct. Well, they, they're cowards. We already know that. Most, in most incidents, when they're confronted, they either kill themselves or give up. And it brings me, I want to go back to the point I made about the private schools and mental illness. Yeah. Uh, they don't take, uh, parents don't know this, and I learned the hard way, that a lot of the public schools, they'll take kids that are emotionally disturbed and violent. They call their diagnosis as oppositional defiant disorder. Okay. And they label those children special needs. Right. I don't know if they do that in London, but here in America, they'll take these kids uh, under the Disabilities Act and then they'll make them, you know, when you think of special needs, you think of a child with cerebral palsy, uh, uh, dyslexia, just mm -hmm. something that's not violent, a learning disability, and yeah. they're labeled special needs and we help them. But parents don't know that. They take these kids that are emotionally disturbed and violent and they label them special needs and it makes them uh, just about untouchable within the school district. I didn't and know that. Private, private schools don't take those type of children. And it's one of the reasons why you don't hear about these, uh, these shootings in private schools because they don't have to take them. You know, public schools, this is what they do in our public schools and parents don't know about this. They have their kids... Like my daughter was sitting next to this person who was skinning animals at the, you know what I mean, in their backyard. One summer, you know, we have his mental records, so I know about this stuff. Uh, one summer, a hatchet went missing in his uh, shed in the back that they had at the house. So they were so, his mental health workers were so worried they couldn't find the hatchet. But that fall, they recommended mainstreaming that thing into my daughter's school. That, that's how bad this gets with parents who, you, you gotta know what's going on sure. with these policies in the yes. schools. And that's why, you know, a, a whole nother uh, episode could be choice, pro-choice for parents to be able to send their children to any school they want. You shouldn't have Absolutely. to send your child to a failing public school. And if you look at the policies, Republicans and Democrats, Republican policy is for choice like in Florida, and then you look at the Democrats where uh, they're, they're, they're against pro-choice for parents and they push these, uh, these teachers' unions that indoctrinate the, uh, our children. Andrew, thank you very much. It's been a fascinating chat. I hope you'll come back and do more. Um, you can find Andrew's work, as I say, at the, pres at the moment, he's the president of the Crime Prevention Research Center. Crimeresearch.org. And his book is available on Amazon, again, why Meadow died, and I urge you to parents, if you're going to put your children in a public school, to read my book, to educate yourself, uh, not to make them the mis bad, bad, terrible mistake I made by putting my daughter in a public school. Andrew Pollock, thank you very much indeed for being us with us on Thought to Action. I'm Tim Wilson. You can keep up to date with Thought to Action. If you haven't already done so, please subscribe to our YouTube channel for updates on what we're doing. You can also catch Thought to Action on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, iHeartRadio and other digital outlets. If you'd like to help us create more content like this and enjoy future exclusive versions of Ask Us Anything and other special content, please join our Patreon community at patreon.com slash thought to action. Also, it really would help if you shared our video or audio podcast with your friends and colleagues. With censorship on the rise, ideas like the ones we talk about are silenced by certain interests and search engine algorithms. So we thank you very much for your support. Please visit our website at londoncenter.org for more information on the London Centre for Policy Research. And again, thank you for watching and listening to Thought to Action. <laughs>